Someone asked this, was Luther a nominalist? Ooh, that's a fun question. And, and I've been addressing that question. Um, and, and that's part of my dissertation is dealing with Luther's. It, and my dissertation is not really on Luther. Um, it, it's a defense of the scholastic theological or, and philosophical method. Um, but, you know, I deal with Luther some because you have to because it's Lutherans. I mean, you, you kind of got to answer the Luther question. Um, but Luther himself on this issue is not my expertise, but I've done quite a bit of reading on the subject. So um, was Luther a nominalist? And, you know, those who might not be f familiar with all the philosophical terminology, um, because not everybody is, and if you're not studying, you know, medieval theology and philosophy, but uh, nominalism is, is a movement that uh, is, is part of the later Middle Ages in which Luther himself was trained. And so there's a difference between realism and nominalism. Realism would be, uh, there's Platonic realism as well as Aristotelian realism, and there's nominalism. Realism says that there are real th things, uh, real essences, real ideas that things participate in in one way or, or another. Um, so there is such a thing as a universal. So take the category of dog. There's such a thing as a universal essence of what dogness is. Okay, so if there's a bunch of individual dogs, they all share somehow in that universal essence of dogness to determine what they are. Uh, nominalism says that there really are only a bunch of individual things, and we clump them together and say they're all dogs because they all have similar features, but there's no actual universal essence of, of dogness. Now, that's a really rough sketch of what that is, but um, this is, is important because a lot of critics of Luther cite nominalism, and there's a lot that goes into nominalism, and it's not just that. Nominalists have different ideas about God's will in particular, uh, and, and people like uh, William of Ockham, there's a there's certain conceptions of, of God's will that God can could freely decide basically whatever he wanted. People say things like, well, if God decided lying could be okay, then it would be. Uh, so there's kind of an arbitrariness in God's will, though they wouldn't really put it that way. Um, and some people have said, have, Roman Catholic critics have said that Luther was a nominalist and he took some of these ideas from William of Ockham and he applied these to philosophy. Others will say, who are opposed to really philosophy at all, who say there's really no use of philosophy for the Christian at all, they would say things like, well, Luther was a nominalist and then he just rejected all previous philosophy. Or Luther hated Plato and Aristotle. He rejected everything they said that played into people like Thomas Aquinas, the medieval uh, scholastic tradition, and and others. Uh, I don't think that Luther is a nominalist. I think that uh, I, I think that Luther is a uh, Platonist, at least in his early career. Um, Luther very much favors Plato. Uh, and a lot of his favorite theologians are influenced by Plato. He was certainly taught by nominalists, and he's going to use some categories. Um, that come from nominalist thinkers. Um, there, there's a certain priority of the word of God that shows up in nominalists and something of a distrust of, of the, in the limits of, of human reason that he's going to grab onto, and I think rightly. Um, he's also going to grab onto certain distinctions that he's going to use to describe um, the Lord's Supper uh, from nominalism and specifically the nature of Christ's presence or omnipresence in, in, in his human nature. Um, so he's going to use some of those categories, um, but when he's talking about the issue of essences, he affirms Plato um, in the Heidelberg uh, Disputation, the Philosophical Theses. He's very, um, he's very clear, I think, that um, that he affirms Plato over Aristotle. He thinks Plato is a lot better than Aristotle. Um, so that you know leaves us with a bunch of questions. But his uh, his primary influences were a lot of the medieval mystics, uh, Bernard of Clairvaux, um, Johann Tauler, and the Theologia Germanica. Those are like the, the three biggest influences on Luther uh, theologically, at least in the mystical tradition. And, and they're all Neoplatonists. They're using ideas of, of Plato. Now, Luther is very critical of Pseudo-Dionysius for, for doing so much uh, Platonism that he's forgetting scripture. And I think later in his life, Luther just, he kind of steps out of the whole philosophical discussion because that's not really where he's at anyway. That, that's not his expertise, and, and he wants to just get back to Scripture. Um, so it's not like he's got some thoroughly developed metaphysical system or something. Um, but when he does deal with it in his early career, he is sympathetic to Plato. And I think that those sympathies are there throughout his career and make the most sense of a lot of his ideas. The idea of the masks of God, I think, makes a lot of sense in a Platonic framework. 
um, in, in terms of his his idea of God's closeness with creation, uh, that that God indwells everything in creation and everything participates him in him somehow. That that creation itself is a mask of God that he hides under that mask and works in and through it. That sounds very much like Neoplatonism, and and I think that the kind of immanentism of God's presence in creation is something that you find very much in, in Platonic thinkers, and it makes the most sense. So Luther's not a philosopher, and I don't think you can kind of pin him down and be like, oh, he's this this or that. Um, but, but I think certainly, while he does take some ideas from nominalism, I think in my approach, Platonism seems to be more so... Um, influential on his thought, if we're going to categorize him with anything. But but even that being said, I, I think there's um, remnants of even Aristotelianism in his sacramental theology, be, because he's so concerned with the spiritual and the physical being so united, um, that the sacraments don't point us elsewhere, right? They don't point us to some, it's not like they're a physical thing that points us to a greater reality in the realm of forms or the realm of ideas or something like that. Um, I, I think his sacramental theology actually really makes more sense with a little bit of an Aristotelian uh, kind of system. I don't think Luther himself saw that, um, but I see it, <laughs> so I think it makes the most sense. Um, and I'm a proponent of, of Aristotelianism, kind of a mix, I guess, of Neoplatonism and Aristotelianism, um, which I find in the, in the, the Lutheran Orthodox. Um, but when you look at the Lutheran Orthodox like Johann Gerhard, they're using a mix of Platonism and Aristotelianism really is what they're doing. They're taking elements of Plato. It, what I found is that um, Lutheran theology makes no sense. All right. Um, what I, thanks for the comment. Uh, what, what I found is that, um, now where was I? I got totally distracted. Uh, in their devotional writings, the Lutheran Orthodox tended to sound more Neoplatonic. It, and that makes sense because that's kind of always been the language of devotion, of union with God. And, and you know, th there's always been kind of a more experiential aspect to Neoplatonism. I mean, just read, you know, Plotinus. Um, it's very experiential. Plato, not so much, um, but but Neoplatonism. So Christians kind of imbibe some of that language. And it makes sense because uh, it jives with a lot of Christian devotion and things like that. Um, so I found that when you're dealing with devotional literature, kind of the Neoplatonic language is used when you're doing more scholastic thought, the Aristotelian categories tend to be more helpful in categorizing things and in making fine distinctions. So they kind of draw on both. Um, and I think that's fine. I, that's kind of what I do too. I, I've come to that conclusion as well. Um, I think there's valid uh, ideas in both, and, and I'm not strictly Platonic or strictly Aristotelian. I think a kind of blend of them both. Some people have said Neoplatonism is a blend of both. I mean, kind of, but I don't see the Neoplatonists using such strict Aristotelian categories of causation and other things too much. Um, as much as is brought into the West uh, through uh, St. Thomas Aquinas. 